sexy on secular sexuality. Hello and welcome to Secular Sexuality, the ACA show where we seek to unleash the sexy beast within. Joining me, of course, is Vila Bianca. Hello, everybody. And with us tonight is filmmaker, author, sex therapist, communicator, conservationist, uh, purveyor of the erotic arts and sciences. What else can we say? Uh, Dr. Susan Block. <laughs> well, you can say a lot. <laughs> you can call me any name you like. Okay. Well, that's definitely something to keep in mind. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, my pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Well, uh, of course, like I said, there are so many different things that we could be talking to you about tonight and certainly hope, hope to in the future. Uh, but we really wanted to start with your book, The Bonobo Way. It came out back in 2014. Uh, we would love if anybody wanted to call in. If you have any questions as we're kind of going through this, we're going to be here at 512-686-0279. That number again is 512-686-0279. Uh, and with that, uh, thanks again for being with us. Tell us just a, a little bit about uh, this book and, and kind of where that project got started for you. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm happy to be here. Just a shout out to Dr. Daryl Ray, who I met um, actually before I wrote the book. Oh, yeah. And I'm so excited to, uh, you know, be in his continuing show. And uh, yeah, The uh, Bonobo Way is a book that I wrote based on the bonobos. And the bonobos are the main love not one true creature who's born from the tree as well as the other. Mm. And they are an important creature and I think they make a beautiful picture. I do use them as an inspiration. Uh, bonobos are um, important for several reasons. One, they're very close to us. They're over 98% genetically similar to us. And, uh, you know, uh, scientists are now saying that they're closer than common chimps, which is pretty damn close. And even if you don't believe in science, you just look into their eyes <laughs> and you can see that missing link, you know? Uh, number two, they have a lot of sex. We'll talk about that more later since this is a show called Secular Sexuality. No question. Uh, quickly, number three, they empower the females. They're very, very beyond me too. And uh, number four, the males are good with it. Male well-being, important part of female empowerment. You can't really have one without the other if you're going to have, you know, males and females and everybody in between and on the outside and the inside. And then number five, and this is probably kind of the most significant thing about bonobos and why they are so important to us. I mean, all the species are important and they all are worth saving, uh, but bonobos use all of the above to make peace through pleasure. That is, bonobos have never been seen killing each other in the wild or captivity, and they seem to use all this sex, all this female empowerment, all this male well-being, and maybe, you know, because they are a little close to us, their intelligence, to, like I said, create peace through pleasure. So, in a coconut shell, that's <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it, it makes sense why, you know, anthropologists and evolutionary psychologists and these different folks would uh, want to study them. Um, yeah. You mentioned that they are, you know, over 98% uh, comparable to us in terms of DNA, uh, perhaps even more so than the common chimp. So how, how does that rank compared to, I guess, common chimps and orangutans and gorillas and, you know, sort of the, the basic understanding of biology that we all sort of go into when we look at the evolutionary chart well we're all apes mm -hmm. the human ape sometimes called the naked ape because oh. we're not so hairy well except you christy uh you know <laughs> hey you got your bonobo coming out That's cool. <laughs> you know uh but uh yeah we're all apes uh bonobos are apes we're all great apes actually bonobos the ones you named 
common chimpanzees, orangutans, uh, gorillas, and we're all great. I mean, there, there are, you know, there's greatness in all the apes and they're all endangered, mm -hmm. kind of including humans these days, except there's a lot of us, so we don't seem endangered. Um, but with climate change, we are. But uh, the other apes, there's not so many. And we do have to save them all, I think, um, you know, because there's so few. And bonobos, there's very, very few. And uh, yeah, I mean, the other apes are great. They don't have as much sex. What can I say? <laughs> I don't think that's so, so great. Not as uh, cool, but, and you know, still not as female empowered. The females are very empowered in Bonoboville. They're kind of the opposite in common chimpville where the males are dominant mm -hmm. and Mike makes right. And you could say, you know, they're Trumpanzies. No, I won't say that, but you could, someone could. Somebody but theoretically, I, not I, you, but I, I someone out there. Say they're very male dominant. They're very might is right. Um, the females get raped a lot. Uh, they make war on each other. They kind of do a lot of the things that humans do when they're in a bad way. Uh, although common chimps kind of have a good time. I mean, one thing great about common chimps is how much fun they have. And I don't think humans have quite as much fun with um, hurting others. Uh, so then you got your gorillas who are great. They're very peaceful, actually. Uh, although they do commit infanticide because when the big And that makes the female um, start to ovulate and be interested in sex, which she wasn't before. So it's all very unfortunate and it's not, doesn't happen among bonobos. Uh, bonobos don't know who the father is anyway. And that's a big part of why they are so peaceful, but it's not the only reason. And then there are orangutans who are really wonderful. And in some ways they look the most like humans, I think, but uh, they, and very smart and relatively peaceful, although they have killed and uh, and they they do kill and they rape and, uh, and they're very kind of solitary compared to uh, bonobos and common chimps who are very social like humans. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the a little something about each of the apes. And I love them all, but bonobos are my favorite. What can I say? I have a boner for bonobos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as we're looking at, at all these different categories, I mean, uh, how close are we related? I mean, compared to a, a human and a gorilla, a human and a bonobo, a, a bonobo to a gorilla, I mean, what does that distance really look like in terms of just giving us an, an understanding of the significance of bonobo culture or behavior? They have charts for that. Um, I'm not the best at describing a chart, except I can say that, uh, you know, up until very recently, they've said that common chimps and bonobos are the closest equally to humans. Mm -hmm. And then come gorillas and then come orangutans. And lately, I've just been reading and seeing, I'm not a primatologist, I'm a sure, sexologist sure. who loves bonobos, but I, I read and I talk to a lot of primatologists and a lot of them are saying, hey, we think bonobos are a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. So hey, yay bonobos, go bonobos. Well, it's, it's just an interesting idea to find this sort of previously neglected uh, model, you know, for humanity. Not to say that we should be modeling ourselves after another species, but simply that we can recognize this sort of narrative about ourselves. You know, I mean, Stanley Kubrick in 2001 and all of these things, we look at chimpanzees and we think of that as sort of our distant cousin. And yeah. bonobos weren't really even known about, uh, I mean, by anybody until relatively recently. But it also seems that they've become very popular in, in common culture in only the past couple of years. I, I well, don't, you know, I'm, common chimps were discovered in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. And that was a big thing. And it still is a big thing. And they are very close to humans. And that is the idea that we have of why humans are the way we are in many ways. And, and there's this whole idea of the killer ape. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. and that uh, common chimps are killers, and they are, not as bad as humans by any means. And all the great apes, except for bonobos, so far, I hope we don't teach them how to kill. I hope that bonobos can teach us how to make peace through pleasure before we teach them how to kill, because they are a learning species just like we are. Mm -hmm. They're not all about instinct. You know, I don't know who is besides maybe just fruit flies, but uh, mostly, you know, I think non-human animals are more thoughtful than we give them credit for, but certainly bonobos are, and they learn from each other and they learn from humans. They learn how to speak um, through sign language and uh, through computers. And I've seen bonobos defeat humans at, you know, computer games. And uh, anyway, common chimps are also very smart. And so uh, up until 1930, nobody knew about bonobos. They were discovered in 1930 and they were thought at first to be a kind of junior common chimp because their head is a little smaller. They're actually taller and they stand up and they walk around on two legs more, uh, but th their head is smaller. So they discovered a skull and uh, they thought, oh, this is just a little common chimp, but it's really a bonobo and it's a separate species. And uh, they gradually start, they being primatologists, started to see that. Um, Yerkes was uh, someone who was at my alma mater and he had a wonderful uh, chimp that he named Prince Chim. He didn't know why Prince Chim was such a cool guy uh -huh. and violent compared to the common chimp that he had. And uh, they hadn't discovered bonobos yet, but then they did. And wow, Prince Chim was a bonobo. And, uh, and gradually they started to acknowledge this, but it was still kind of not something that most primatologists wanted to study in the 50s and even the 60s uh, because bonobos were just so sexual mm -hmm. and they looked like us or maybe like the professor that you're trying to uh, do your <laughs> dissertation for, you know, and you're trying to get tenure and uh, it's just not, you know, it was awkward. It was embarrassing. Sure. To study bonobos. They're so sexual. They have sex right in front of you. They invite you to have sex. Uh, they are wild. And uh, and they don't fit into those boxes of the killer ape. And, and so you got to start in their female empowered and all these things. And so it took a while before the hallowed halls of academia were filled with bonobo loving primatologists. Mm -hmm. And now they are. I think they kind of are. I think it's happening. Yeah. I think that um, bonobos are being acknowledged. They're being taught in anthropology classes, in psychology classes, and in all the classes, and certainly primatology, and they're being studied uh, as much as common chimps, and they're being acknowledged, and uh, and even the culture is starting to say things I've been saying for <laughs> all those 30 years. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, you know, I'm happy to see it. I'm I'm really happy uh, to see that a lot of people, including uh, the females in the Me Too movement, the human females, are acknowledging the female empowered nature of bonobos. I just hope they also acknowledge the male well-being angle mm -hmm. of that. That's very important too. That is so interesting to me. The fact that there are areas that no one would think of that have been touched by purity culture and by this this concept of sex as bad and, and as taboo. That, that even yeah. academics and even, these researchers and yeah, yeah, it's zoologists. All, it's not something that would come up normally, but this is fascinating to me that we are lacking in, in knowledge or have been for so long just because ew, sex ugly, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, when I first found out about bonobos and it was on television, on a PBS special called The Nature of Sex, which I just loved because I was a young sex therapist and I had just gotten married and I wanted to understand, you know, humans in terms of our animal nature. And it was a, like a four part series and they didn't have internet. So you had to actually watch every night. And on the last night, they showed bonobos and they didn't say anything about how female empowered they were. 
they just showed them having sex. And I was just amazed at how like human they looked. They, they just, you know, looked like a porn movie with a lot of hair, you know, <laughs> maybe like the seventies. Uh, so anyway, I just thought, wow, this, these are, are sexual creatures whose, whose community is, is, based on a cohesion that is established through sex. And then the announcer says, not only that, they don't make war. They don't kill each other. And I went, oh my God, this is make love, not war. This is the hippie ethic that everybody's been debunking. Debunk, debunk, humans aren't like that. We can't do that. We all turn into Charlie Manson or George W. Bush. And you know, it's it's impossible for us to be sex positive and peaceful. It just doesn't happen. But Bonobo Show, not only does it happen, but it happens, it's kind of a cause and effect kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's just remarkable how as our our understanding of science expands, as our understanding of the world expands, how all of these boxes that we like to put humans in as, you know, only existing as male and female, as only existing as heterosexual, as only existing as these uh, warlike uh, primates with more sophisticated and advanced clubs rather than seeing us as these hypersexual bonobos just with a more sophisticated language. Uh, as we expand our definition and our understanding of the world, our definition of ourself is changing. I, I think that's a really exciting time to be a part of. Absolutely, Christy. And, you know, as a sex therapist, a fellow sex therapist, <laughs> Uh, although, of course, I'm not licensed and or accredited by ASECT, although I did just uh, deliver the Bonobo Way at ASECT, oh, wow. uh, so yeah. I, I do uh, participate in my Outre Way. So in any case, yes, I, uh, I do have a lot of kinky clients. Um, I have a lot of clients who are from very religious backgrounds and live in religious cultures and want to understand their kinky or somewhat non-vanilla desires and want to understand you know why and how these occur and bonobos do help with that like i said we shouldn't use them as blueprints we shouldn't all you know have sex uh with everybody in the community uh, as bonobos tend to do and we shouldn't all you know, have uh, sleep in trees, um, you know, <laughs> although I don't know, some of that could be cool. And some people might like having sex with everyone in their community. Uh, and bonobos show that there's nothing wrong with that. And, uh, and they show that, you know, bisexuality, uh, certainly a certain level of androgyny, the females are very male in many ways, the males are very laid back and in touch with their feminine side. Um, they do a lot of outer course. It's not all about penis and vagina. Yeah. They, they do a lot of um, licking and touching and squeezing and, and tickling and a little bit of spanking even. Uh, and they, they just, you know, they have a, a kind of a kinky, way of approaching sex and i think the the really bottom line of kink is that it's non-reproductive sex mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people say non-reproductive sex is not natural it's natural to put the penis in the vagina and make a baby well okay that's natural but bonobos show us that a lot of other kinds of recreational sex is uh is also quite natural and not only is it natural but it's good it's good yeah, it serves a good in that religious way good for the community mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's something that I, I feel uh, I hear over and over and over again, particularly when we're talking about homosexuality or these different forms of sexual expression. Um, I mean, the Catholic... Bonobos are gay, and that's okay. 
Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, this idea that sex serves a broader purpose than procreation, that sex exists as a form of communication, as a form of uh, soothing, as a form of, you know, both self-soothing and of maintaining group cohesion. Uh, and yeah, I mean, we see it every week in couples therapy and things like that, the importance of sex to bond two people together, but it certainly doesn't have to be limited to that either. Right. And, you know, if you're tuned in live, happy self-love September. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, May is Masturbation Month. And as St. George of Carlin said, if God had intended us not to masturbate, he or she would have made our arms shorter. And that is so obvious when you look at bonobos and they do love to masturbate. And I must admit, they masturbate more in the zoo and in captivity. And actually, maybe humans would too, if they were allowed to. Uh, and because, you know, it's a, a little bit frustrating in there. And masturbation is a soothing action. Um, it's it's trying to help yourself with your problems and with your needs and, and your need to release. Um, and, uh, and I guess in the zoo, it's like a prison in a way, even though mm -hmm. they have a pretty nice pad in some of the zoos. Uh, but, you know, they need to do a lot of self-soothing. Um, so they probably masturbate more in the zoo. But uh, all these other kinds of so-called kinky uh, activities bonobos engage in as well, like, um, you know, foot. They Some of them really get into the foot fetish. They're like rawr, 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 chewing on these toes. And yeah, they're all pretty bisexual, um, but they do develop favorites. Mm. And sometimes the favorite is of the same sex. And the favorite doesn't usually last their whole life, although it, he or she could. Um, and so, you know, sometimes they could be more gay and sometimes more straight and sometimes completely bisexual. Certainly uh, the, the homosexuality among bonobos, the, the gay sex, whatever you want to call it, is uh, very, very important to keeping the peace. Mm. I'll just put that out there. <laughs> so is the, re the, the, I almost said regular, so is the penis and vagina and the boy girl sex. That's also mm. important. Uh, it's all important, but it's very interesting how important the gay sex is to keeping the peace in Bonoboville. Well, and it's just fascinating to me to think of like a bonobo Kinsey scale and this idea that there is genetic variability and variability of orientation and that this, you know, very close cousin to humanity models these behaviors that we think of as being very human and oftentimes for many of us as uh, corrupt and as evidence that our divine nature is being destroyed by the world when in reality we see it beautifully in the natural world in a way that's functional. Yeah, and that's what I tell my clients, you know, it's natural. I mean, not every natural behavior is a good one. Sure. Rape is natural, mm -hmm. not a good behavior. Non-consensual sex in general is pretty natural. Uh, I mean, bonobos do that, but not hardly at all. And if they do, and, you know, of course, if it would be a, a male with a female, or though it could be a female with a male, usually the other bonobos will come in and jump on the culprit Intervene. and stop it. And certainly that's a big, big part of female solidarity because the males are bigger and stronger and they could defeat the females. A lot of guys say when I do my Bonobo Away lectures, why do the guys put up with this? You know, I mean, they're just like the common chimps. They could beat the females down oh, sure. easily, yeah. physically, but they like their life. The females treat them good and... If they do beat on a female, her sisters will beat up on him. Mm. And whereas one female is not going to beat, is not going to succeed against one male, two probably will. And three, well, it's girls' night out. <laughs> and uh, so the boys know to behave uh, or else they're in trouble as well as they kind of like the life. They do like the life. And the females are very good to them. They provide them with sex, as well as they encourage them to have sex with each other, which they also like. 
Yeah, you you have made it clear that, you know, uh, we want to sort of look and learn from without necessarily taking a direct blueprint. And of course, we want to be aware of sort of the, the naturalistic fallacy. Like you said, just because something is natural doesn't make it noble, helpful, good, right, just, I mean, whatever term we want to apply there. But what are some of the, the aspirational aspects of bonobo culture that you wish humans would see more of in themselves? I mean, I, I definitely hear what you're talking about with female solidarity with uh, female empowerment as well as uh, male welfare, but what what might that look like uh, for humanity? Well, first of all, just to address your particular audience. Sure. Um, bonobos are not religious, obviously, <laughs> uh, but they are in certain definitions of the word spiritual creatures. I, I was once on a show where a priest said, uh, no other um, creature on earth is spiritual. No other creature could go to heaven. And I don't really believe in heaven, but I'm always like, hey, if it exists, who knows? I don't know. But I would put my money where my mouth is. If it exists, bonobos are going there. And if it exists, lots of animals are going there, not just humans. Well, humans aren't that special of an animal. And bonobos they they have this this love and this compassion and yeah we can explain it through their actions um through their female solidarity their female empowerment through the male well-being through the peace through pleasure through the sex but it gives them this empathy and this this holiness i think that uh that can help a lot of people who uh are suffering from religious sexual abuse and trying to move beyond that and find not a model, not a role model, but kind of an inspiration mm -hmm. and, uh, and something special. Bonobos aren't angels. They're animals just like us and they are violent. They can be, but they just don't kill each other. So uh, I, maybe they're more in touch with their angel side than we are. I don't know. Um, uh, you know, they have problems, but uh, they seem to be able to work their problems out. Uh, of course, human encroachment could uh, stop all that. Now, by the way, speaking of religion, I just want to show you my pillow. <laughs> um, see, I can't ever understand how uh, religious people want to like have a pillow where they lean up against the sacred last supper. But, uh, you know, Hey, I think it's a beautiful painting and, um, I, I love Jesus. A lot of people say they, they ask, uh, what would Jesus do? Uh -huh. And they don't know what to do. Sure. And, you know, I do too. Sometimes I, I look to religious figures. I also look to atheists like Spinoza. What would Spinoza do? I also look to the bonobos. I say, what would a bonobo do? if I'm not sure how to handle uh, a situation. Uh, so, you know, they, they are an inspiration in that way, in that spiritual way. Um, and, uh, and of course, an inspiration in that sexual way where, you know, you might feel strange that you, um, you know, want to have sex with more than just your significant other. And bonobos show you how natural that is. They have favorites, like I said, but they tend to have sex with different bonobos. Um, they also like strangers a lot. They like their friends a lot, but nothing excites a bonobo as much as uh, some enchanted evening with a stranger, you know? And, uh, and, and I guess this shows us that we too can reach out to the stranger uh, and, and we have a desire to do that. And that that desire is part of our, our tendency, our, our initiative to make peace through pleasure. Yeah. Um, you could say, you know, my, one of my inspirations is Dr. Franz de Waal, who is a primatologist. And uh, he has said that um, we have a chimpanzee side, we humans, and we have a bonobo side. And so, you know, are we going to be jealous and warlike like our common chimp side? Or are we going to be sexual and uh, compassionate 
and emotion, e empathetic, like our bonobo side. Uh, you know, bonobos are a little Jesus-like, except for the celibacy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I certainly like that model a lot better than the old cartoon of the you angel know, the and the demon. demon. Yeah. I, I would much rather have a, a common chimp and a bonobo. I, yeah. You know, I, I definitely can't imagine who I'd listen to more, but... <laughs> yeah, angels are fake. Bonobos are real. They really exist. They are as amazing as angels. They're as amazing as the aliens that we look to, hoping, hoping, are we going to find somebody that's like us? Well, there is somebody that's like us, and they're right here on Earth, and we hardly know them. We've only discovered them in 1930, and they were censored for so many years, and they're still censored. Mm -hmm. I was kicked off of AOL <laughs> in the early days of the internet for for a few things, for recommending masturbation. <laughs> I, I, I didn't have any nudity, any person nudity, but I did show bonobos. And I was kicked off because of bonobos, showing bonobo sex, kicked off of AOL. I still have their letter. And they wrote letters in those days. And, uh, you know, it was eye-opening. I, 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 like, couldn't believe it. I, like, well, this is primatology. But, yeah, they, they are close to us. Uh, they, um, they're, they're amazing. And I'm very inspired by them, and I hope you are, too. Release your inner bonobo. <laughs> it's interesting because I feel like maybe maybe this is just me reading into it, but part of the reason maybe uh, the focus is on common chimps is like we can look at them and be like, oh, well, I'm not that bad. Therefore, I must be a good I'm, human. I'm more evolved. Right. Like, look how evolved I am. I'm not murdering my kids and raping mm -hmm. the females in the group. So I must be good. And then looking at maybe the bonobo, it's like, oh, maybe I, I'm not the most evolved one on, of the bunch in this in this scenario. And yeah, that kind of screws up that whole humans are the stewards of the earth kind of thing, doesn't right. it? Right. It screws it up. Bonobos definitely screw up a lot of what most major monotheistic religions and even some of the pantheistic religions, although the pantheistic religions are at least a little bit better, but definitely the monotheistic religions bonobos screw it all up they they put the lie to all those lies and yeah i mean the bonobos their latin name is pan paniscus and in a way they are ruled by the uh the god pan the lord of nature and one thing i like about greek and roman mythology is that it it is mythology it's stories and i think on some level they kind of felt that. They didn't have this purity test about, do you really believe in the gods and goddesses? Well, maybe sometimes they did it for political reasons, like we do, I guess. But uh, yeah, I mean, they had all these different gods and goddesses and uh, and for different types of interests, you know, and, and Pan was certainly about the earthy uh, desires and bonobos are kind of in that realm. They are uh, Pan Paniscus. That is their Latin name. And I like it. I like it better than them being called pygmy chimpanzees, which is another name for them, which just makes really them sound like little yeah. chimps. <laughs> Yeah, well, as we, you know, look to them for all of this inspiration and maybe kind of redefine our views on, on humans and what we are meant to be and, you know, this notion that we were created by God to be superior to the animals and this one just happens to look a lot like us and, you know, getting away from all of those notions and realizing, I guess, our, our potential uh, I'd love to hear you tell the audience just a little bit about the bonobo liberation therapy that you work on with your institute and uh, with your clients. Yeah, well, uh, we provide all types of sex therapy mm -hmm. uh, for every desire or lack of desire and, uh, and underlying it and sometimes really focusing on it is bonobo liberation therapy. And it it's based on a lot of what we've been talking about and how the bonobos can be an inspiration to uh, less than the straight and narrow desires that, uh, 
that so many of us think we ought to have. And even if we're not religious, uh, we sometimes think there's something wrong with us for having uh, you know, desires perhaps for different partners, although there is a polyamory movement now. Uh, but still, a lot of people do feel um, weird, I guess, for even having gay desires, even though that's pretty culturally acceptable. If you're down there in the South or the Midwest or some other religious environment, perhaps I have clients in Saudi Arabia that call me mm -hmm. and in the depths of Alabama. I don't know who's more restrictive about sex and religion, but they all have the same desires and fantasies as everybody else does. And, uh, and yet people in those environments are, are very stressed, very worried, very torn. Uh, and, and also people, you know, even in liberated LA and San Francisco can be, torn by what they think they're supposed to be. So bonobos provide an inspiration uh, for you. It also provides an understanding that sex is important, that sex is not some side thing mm -hmm. that you shouldn't be doing so much of, that you shouldn't be thinking so much about. Bonobos show us that it's important to the individual, to the relationship, and to all of society that if you're ignoring that, that you get like the incel movement. There are no incels in Bonoboville. <laughs> there just aren't. You don't, you don't, the, the, the community would recognize that as a problem. That, that isolated behavior and yeah. And, and, and help somehow. And it is a complicated problem, but it's gotten that way partly because of our more common chimp like society and and more you know female denigrating and sex denigrating society is what has spawned the incels and i have some incel clients uh and incels need love incels need sex you know and they don't get it and uh and and bonobos show us that they should get it and it's something that's an important part of, it should be an important part of feminism, but too many feminists just want to say, oh, these guys, they don't know how to treat women, just throw them in the trash. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I certainly hear a lot of that, and I, I wonder... Uh, how different, I mean, even just YouTube culture to, you know, speak directly to our audience tonight, how different YouTube culture would look if people understood what you said at the top of the show about how female empowerment and male welfare are not antagonistic to one another. It, it certainly isn't as if as one goes up, the other goes down, but instead that just general well-being for everybody can be lifted up. And then we don't have angry young men screaming at each other on the internet and or bringing assault rifles into movie theaters. At least not so much. Yeah. We're getting out of control. You know, like I said, bonobos aren't angels. They're animals like us and they might be screaming, oh, they, they get jealous, they get upset. You know, they, they hit each other. They just kind of control it. They, they stop short of killing each other. They don't have much rape. They don't have much violence. And they, they, they work it out. They deal with the same emotions that we have. And they, they work it out. These emotions are real. We are complicated creatures, just like bonobos. They're complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, we're social creatures. We have, you know, these kinks. They have kinks, too. They love to combine food and sex. By the way, that gives me an opportunity to promote. <laughs> Food and sex? Splosh and art. Uh -huh. Bonobos love to splosh. There's stuff on bonobos in here, but it's mostly about humans. Um, but it's it's um, it's a particular fetish. I have magazines on all different fetishes, uh, but uh, this is one that basically combines food and sex in the same act. I'm not saying all humans should do that by any means. Uh, although I do think all humans should recognize that food and sex are two of the basic needs of life. And, uh, and they're also two basic representations of love. And uh, that they don't necessarily equal love, but that we use them a lot to mean love. And 
and emotion and and that we should um, deal with that. Anyway, some people deal with it through a kink called Splosh. And so we have a magazine devoted to Splosh and Art featuring Danielle Watts and Chef P Live and a lot of vegan Splosh here. By the way, we also have Spank and Art, which is um, another fetish. And it also features bonobos because they slap each other, spank each other, mm -hmm. tickle each other. They have kinky, they have aggressive uh, erotic maneuvers that they do and that can sometimes make people feel like, oh, they're not so peaceful. Well, excuse me, they are. You could also say that about some BDSM people. Oh, they're, you know, they're, they're hitting each other. Well, you know, we have violence in us and it's good to get that out in a consensual, uh, careful, responsible way. Bonobos seem to be able to do that and we can too. So, you know, we have all these kings. Oh, uh, we need to, you know, it, it's not all lovey-dovey, but on the other side of it, bonobos aren't always having hard, you know, porn star sex. Aggressive. They have a lot of slow sex. In fact, they take all day to have sex. You know, a lot <laughs> of foreplay. So foreplay is cool. You know, sometimes, in fact, this is something odd that I'm still trying to wrap my head around. Bonobos... Actually, the penis and vagina part is, or in anus, uh, is very quick. It's just a few seconds. They don't spend a lot of time on that. They spend a lot of time on what we might call foreplay, on the licking and the sucking and the mm, squeezing and rubbing. Uh, they do a lot of that. And they kind of demonstrate to us how important foreplay is. Yeah, I think that's, again, just a reminder about the non-procreative nature of sex, that, yes. you know, actual intercourse is, is relatively small. And even, you know, getting away from words like foreplay and just acknowledging that that is sex and that mm -hmm. all sex, you know, whether it's between uh, two men, two women, et cetera, is still valid in that it serves that same function of, you know, drawing closeness and creating, you know, intimacy, fun, stress relief. I mean, these different aspects. Yeah, uh, we actually have a question in the chat. Um, uh, uh, someone asks, uh, what are Bonobo's average community size? <laughs> but, uh, I would say anywhere from 10 to 50. Oh, wow. That's, that's big. Mm, yeah. They have bigger communities than among common chimps. Mm -hmm. Uh, common chimps want maybe part of common chimps problems, uh, part of bonobo, you know, bonobos are more urban. I mean, they got bigger communities, still very small communities compared to human cities, but, um, they, they have a lot of people. They're not into the nuclear family. That's for sure. Okay. Interesting. And by the way, I just want to say one term I use a lot. I didn't invent it, but instead of foreplay is outer course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which, I think that's an important you know, idea. That can be just as important as the so-called main course. It's not an appetizer. <laughs> it's, it's the thing, outer course. And it can be much safer sex than intercourse. And, uh, and yeah, bonobos, the females do a lot of what the primatologists call genitogenital or GG rubbing, where they rub each other's um, vulvas and clitorises together uh, and uh, and they have orgasms they have big orgasms from doing that and they scream they scream because you know why do why do females scream it's interesting um, they scream more when there are others around uh, than when they're all alone why do you think that is Oh, I actually think I, I looked this up, this up once. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't it have something to do with attracting other mates and letting them yes. know, like, I'm yeah. here? They want other mates, exactly. They're not, mate they're selection. Not, it's not mentally. They want others to know they're hot, they're available, that they, they could do it with you too. You know, so they <laughs> moan and they scream. And, and interestingly, among bonobos, they do it not just to attract males, but also to attract other females. Mm. Mm. Yeah, see, oh. th that aspect of it I, I definitely wasn't aware of. Um, but you you reference in your book a number of times, uh, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Christopher Ryan's work, uh, Sex at yes. Dawn, 
which Shout I Shout out to Dr. Christopher Ryan, author of Sex at Dawn. Yeah, absolutely. I found his book to be absolutely fascinating. I think it may be in part, uh, there's certainly others, but in part why bonobos are becoming more uh, understood and recognized just in pop culture. Um, but anyway, he he does yeah. really illustrate that idea of uh, internal mate selection and this notion that um, monogamy, at least sexual monogamy, is not all that common among pri among certain types of primates, bonobos in particular. And in ancient humans, likely, uh, we were not monogamous for most of our existence as a species, and that those. Uh, I believe the the scientific or scholastic term for it is uh, female vocalizations. Uh, those those great uh, bed shattering moans are a way of inviting other people into the party, which I think is just yes. completely different from the worldview of sexuality that we're taught in in school on TV. I mean, just in every other aspect of life. And let us be taught that now. And let us say amen and a women. <laughs> so, uh, yes, and that's in Krista's book, I believe, about the female vocalization. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but yeah, Krista's book and Sex at Dawn, and he's coming out with a new one, uh, Civilized to Death. Mm -hmm. And I do think that a lot of people are opening their eyes to our polyamorous past, or let's just say our non-monogamous past. Sure. And to seeing, you know, hey, maybe if the diet was good, um, maybe the sex life was also good. Uh, maybe certain things about that were more egalitarian. You know, he talks about fierce egalitarians and that they were very adamant about uh, nobody getting too much credit for anything. And uh, and that, you know, if, if you got... Um, you know, if you brought home a big kill from the hunt, and bonobos are hunters, by the way, they're not vegetarians. They eat mostly vegetables and fruits, mostly fruits, actually. Uh, but, um, but they do eat a little meat every once in a while. So some people say that means they're not uh, peaceful, but they don't kill each other. That's the main thing. They don't kill sure. each other, okay? So don't get on them for having a hamburger every once in a while. <laughs> All right. So anyway... Uh, yeah, uh, but but I think a lot of people are seeing, are, are looking at our, our distant prehistoric past and seeing inspiration in that, partly because of, you know, just the qualities of life and partly because, you know, our, our massive civilization might not be what we would call so civilized and maybe the most humane creatures aren't even human. Hmm. They're bonobos. Because bonobos are kind of close to what these prehistoric humans may have been like. I mean, I personally, and again, I'm, you know, a student of, of uh, sex at dawn and, and a lot of things like that. And I don't, I don't think that we started killing each other, certainly didn't start making war on each other until we got civilized, until we started having something worth killing over. Mm -hmm. uh, bonobos don't have anything worth killing over. You know, common chimps are much more bloodthirsty and they have territory. Uh, bonobos have territory, but maybe they don't take it so seriously. But humans, yeah, we get territory. We own that land. We own the animals on that land. We own the crops on that land. We own the people on that land. And then when somebody wants to steal it, we got to defend it. And then we start killing people and we start war and uh, all that stuff gets going. And my feeling is that, you know, probably was a woman who discovered where babies come from, <laughs> you know, but once men got the news, good news, the bad news, mm -hmm. that, yeah, there's one dad and it's you, or it's not. And then they start going, whoa, wait a second. I got kids and these are my kids. These are my, these kids belong to me. And so where did we get these kids from this woman? Well, that woman belongs to me. I can't have her having sex with other guys. Oh my God. 
Because if she has sex with other guys, those kids don't belong to me. I'm growing other kid, uh, somebody else's kids with my money, my crops, my animals. And this is bad. Can't do this. Got to imprison the woman. Got to imprison the kids too. You know, and put them to work on the farm. Put the woman to work. Lock her up and, and defend her with uh, spears and then guns and then bombs. Nuclear bombs, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember that uh, these ideas of mate guarding for inheritance, of developing land, of agriculture, and uh, the territorialism that comes from this is the house that I built, that all of that is basically a blink in the eye, uh, evolutionarily speaking, that that's not necessarily a part of our genetic heritage. That's just something that we only very recently, I mean, the advent of agriculture is a blip in our existence in basically this state genetically. So we can, you know, we don't have to say that there's a, a right or a wrong to our genetic heritage, but this idea that we have to be this way because that's the way we were built or designed or developed uh, just isn't accurate. No, it's, it's uh, you know, we've been in these bodies with these minds for, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand years, at least a hundred thousand. And we've only been doing this as you say, farming, mate guarding thing for at the most 12,000 years, really more like with civilization, 5,000 years. And then of course, religion is a part of that. Uh, It starts with the pagan religions, but um, again, I think bonobos are spiritual. I think humans, you know, found spirits in the trees and spirits in everyone and hoped that something happened beyond death because death is frightening to us all. And so we have a spirituality that hopes something in the stars is there, something else, you know, but this whole idea that there are gods that rule over us and that we have the right to rule over the animals and, and even the plants, uh, you know, that's something that religion has to enforce and that is part of owning private property is part of, uh, you know, the whole, what eventually led to the capitalist system and leads to, you know, the, the male dominant system and leads to ultimate destruction. So either we're going to learn from the bonobos and ourselves and, and other nature and, and make some very vital changes or we're not. And if we don't, there might be a few humans left and maybe we'll, practice the bonobo way. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm so torn. I mean, I certainly don't want us to destroy human civilization. I'm, I'm, I'm on that, you know, bandwagon of trying to educate (laughs) my fellow humans and save not the earth, the earth will survive, but more like, I guess, save a lot of life on earth, um, including us and certainly save the bonobos. Um, I don't know if it's time yet to talk about saving bonobos, but um, really was my, my next question. Um, oh, okay, we're, we're definitely um, synced up then. So <laughs> we should save the bonobos. I know there's a lot of species that need saving. We're killing so many every day and, and they all are worth saving. But, uh, you know, bonobos are so close to us and they have so much to teach us. And, uh, and so, you know, I have a, a foundation, Block Bonobo Foundation, mm-hmm. uh, but we contribute to three very special organizations and I encourage you to contribute to them and I'll describe them just a little bit, each of them. First is um, Lola Ya Bonobo, which rescues bonobos. Um, The bushmeat trade is rockin' and it's horrific. Bonobos basically are doing fine in the jungle. Well, you know, all the species are suffering from the degradation of all the rainforest, of the, of the main rainforest in the Amazon, as well as the Congo. They live in the second biggest rainforest in the world, which is the Congo rainforest in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And they, though bushmeat hunting is illegal, they do it. And, uh, and bushmeat is not on the menu, but, you know, you can ask for it and get it. And it's terrible, and, and we have to do what we can to stop it. But meanwhile, when they kill a mother, the uh, the babies are left, and they don't generally kill the babies because they're too small. They don't have that much meat 
it's disgusting, but you know, anyway, so the babies are saved. Sometimes they sell them to a zoo and they shouldn't because the zoos don't know what to do with them. Any zoo that would buy a baby from uh, black market people like that is not a good zoo. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, you know, sometimes my friends run by Claudine Andre, who's the, I call her the Joan of Arc of Bonobos. And uh, she's fabulous. And she founded Lola Ya Bonobo. And my other friend, Vanessa um, Woods, uh, is also there and runs Friends of Bonobos. And Dr. Brian Hare is associated with uh, the Friends of Bonobos. And they have a sanctuary outside of Kinshasa called Lola, which is Bonobo, means Bonobo Paradise, Lola Yabonobo. And they bring these uh, almost dead little babies back to life and, and then ultimately send them back into the jungle or the halfway house, really, the jungle near Lola. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a lot of them do very well. And then there's another organization called Bonobo Conservation Initiative, which is run by my other friend, who I've known since the 1990s, Sally Cox. And uh, Bonobo Conservation Initiative is working right in the jungle, right in the Congo rainforest uh, with the villagers to stop the bushmeat hunting. They are, they have their people who are, you know, defending the bonobos literally and they there are the difference is in their rainforest there's a lot of um villagers that live there village um there's a lot of people living among the wildlife and but they live in a very very almost prehistoric way and not quite not quite everybody nowadays is influenced by civilization but but they're kind of close and and they understand they, uh, the Mogandu people called the bonobos are brothers and sisters. Uh, they, they understand the bonobos are special and should not be killed uh, and should not be eaten, that that's like cannibalism. But there are people that come in from other cultures like Rwanda and other places and, and they kill the bonobos. And so Sally and the Bonobo Conservation Initiative, please give to them because they help, they've established the bonobo peace forest and uh, they help to stop the killing and they deliver babies to lowly Abinovo. So it's like a, a network. And then part of the network is promotion. I do my promoting, but I'm a little kinky. I got my adult network that I talk to about sex and bonobos and a lot of the primatologists and even the promoters are a little reluctant to talk about the sex so much. They talk about the love, they talk about the peace, they talk about the female empowerment, but they don't talk so much about the sex. And I understand because, you know, bonobos are kinky, uh, but I do. And so anyway, but there's all kinds of promotion that's important and promotion that doesn't focus on sex, promotion that kind of focuses more holistically on bonobos. And also bonobos are, are great parents, great mothers, and in a way parents, because the dads, they don't know who the dad is. So they're all like great uncles and they don't kill them. So, you know, uh, common chimps and, uh, and gorillas and orangutans sometimes kill uh, babies. So bonobos don't do that. So that makes them great fathers, I think. And even though they don't know who the father is. So, uh, but the mothers are really great. Uh, really great. And um, so the Bonobo Project run by a mother. Um, and so it is a, a wonderful promotional um, society, the Bonobo Project. And so they're, I think that's all three. <laughs> well, and it breaks my heart to think about the ways that not only are uh, populations shrinking and not only is there a very legitimate risk of extinction in, in these different things, but just the way that you said everybody, uh, all species are being affected by civilization and the way that uh, we could be affecting bonobo culture, I guess. Um, you know, I find it really fascinating as more research is being done, we recognize that a lot of what we think about humans uh, comes from like Jane Goodall's studies at Gombe 
And we're starting to recognize that those studies, uh, as beautiful and important as they were, may have been flawed in a lot of ways and that we may have been altering their behavior with the way that the researchers were interacting with them. And so now I love love Jane Goodall. I love Dr. Jane Goodall. Absolutely. One of my heroes personally. She sent me a note, her assistant did, which, Mm. you know, (laughs) uh, and it says she loves the Bonobo Way. And I had sent her a free book. And so, um, you know, I'm a big fan and I don't believe her research was flawed. It's just she was studying common chimps. Yeah, she well, I certainly don't mean to suggest that the interpretation wrong. that we are killer apes. I'm sorry, but it is a little bit of a nitpick here. But I do believe it's important that we have research on all these apes and that they are what they are. And then the bonobos are are should be the subject of a lot of research now, as they are, and uh, and they should be. And uh, more and more research is being done so that we see. We are not necessarily killer apes. Yeah, I guess we are uh, because of what we do. But so many of us aren't. So many of us are against it. You know, all the all the common chimps are for the killing. They're all for it. There's they're all on board with that. Mm -hmm. There's nobody going no no unless it's maybe their friend. Of course, (laughs) they Mm -hmm. defend their friends, but they're not against killing in general. There are a lot of humans that are against killing in general, and I don't believe that's just because of our so-called human intelligence. I believe it's because it's our bonobo side. It's the side of us that really doesn't want to kill, that that knows that killing hurts. And there are a lot of people who do kill and come back with something we call PTSD because killing hurts, not just the people who are killed, although it hurts them a lot more, but it, it does kill, it hurts the people who do the killing. And that's because, eh, I don't know if it's so natural to humans to yeah. kill, you know. Well, like that. I just find it interesting, but also kind of terrifying to think that there are, you know, perhaps a, a generation of bonobos that are growing up after having been orphaned by hunters and then mm-hmm. raised in this sort of awkward captivity, re-released yeah. into the wild. And then I think about, you know, the, the shrinking of territory, the added stress of a lack of resources, all of these different complications yeah. that we introduce to their lives, recognizing what we know about humans, about, I mean, about lab rats, about really every animal that we study, that these types of complications, these types of obstacles can dramatically affect behavior. And so just... The the idea that lost to the world could be the science of studying a, you know, truly primitive, truly untouched bonobo and getting an un- understanding of, if not of what humans were like pre-civilization, pre-agriculture, but at least having that link that is rapidly shrinking. That, that's a terrifying idea to me. It's very terrifying. And I appreciate all of the research being done. But every time I open my Google alerts to bonobo, I worry that some researcher put a spear in a bonobo's hands and that she threw it, that I'm going to find out that she threw it, you know, because, Hey, why not? And, or that he put a gun in a bonobo's hands and that she pulled the trigger because she's curious. And then she goes, Oh, what's that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I, I hope they never do that. And like I said, I hope we learn from them before they learn our nasty ways. Um, I mean, and I have mixed feelings because I love, you know, that certain bonobos are brought up by humans and can communicate through computers. I mean, I think it's kind of messed up. I think zoos are kind of messed up. But on the other hand, if it wasn't for the San Diego Zoo, I wouldn't have made some bonobo friends that I've made. And I... I have mixed feelings about human civilization in general. Like, <laughs> I don't think I'd be it? here. I'd be like you. I'm wearing contact lenses, but I'd be bumping into things if without human civilization. I would have mm-hmm. killed myself a long time ago bumping into a tree. So, uh, you know, I'm grateful for um, opticians and I'm grateful for so many doctors and, and wonderful uh aspects of human civilization but there can we possibly take some of the bad aspects out i don't know uh i just know that bonobos are cool and we should be inspired by them we should be inspired sexually i'm a sex therapist 
I think that would help in the immediate short run with a lot of our sexual problems. And by sexual problems, I do mean a lot of the ones that fuel violence. And yeah. uh, and I, I just think um, that bonobos should be saved so that we can continue. And yes, studying them is very scary because we could, we could corrupt them. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know, I, I guess no, not so far. I mean, Dr. Brian Hare talks about meeting a beautiful older female bonobo who was released, I'm gonna cry, from a medical facility where she spent her whole life. And he thought she would be angry with her. With, he thought she would be angry with him. And she wasn't. She embraced him. Really so they do understand And they can even feel it when they've been mistreated. It, it shows that, you know, all that stuff, and I do believe it as a sex therapist, that if you've been abused, you're more likely to abuse, but you don't have to. Yeah, I think it's a, a very beautiful thing to see our own humanity sort of reflected in these different ways. And uh, I, I do hope that we continue to, to learn and to just build up a better understanding of our whole world and ourselves as part of that. Um, I do want to take this moment to, I guess, uh, apologize to everybody watching. We've had a, a little bit of trouble with the phones, but we oh. do seem to have them working now. We have got somebody on the line. So uh, if you'd like, uh, Dr. Block, I'd love to jump on the phones with Nicole. Sure. Okay, let's do it. Hi, Nicole. Hello. <laughs> hey, what can we do for you tonight? Um, well, I just have a... a well, a couple questions about bonobos, but, uh, you know, wh whatever y'all have time for. Um, one of the things I was wondering um, is the size of their community and if that has anything, uh, if that affects, um, well, based basically their monogamy or lack thereof. Like, does it, does their aggression change for a larger size community or do they regulate their community to keep it smaller on purpose? Like, is there any any way to keep it small. Sending people like, off and uh, splintering people or splintering bonobos off intentionally and, and things like that when they reach a certain size, that, that kind of thing. Right. Right. Yeah. Just, just for the size of it, not, you know, somebody did something wrong. We got to kick them out, but sure. Hey, our community is getting too big. It's time for you. This one to go for a reason or another. <laughs> um, and if, if that has anything to do, you know, if, if that affects their aggression, uh, or, or anything like that, just mm -hmm. the, the size of the community. Okay, well, it sounds like your question is kind of connected to the one we had earlier. And yeah, I mean, they, they have larger communities in general than their counterpart of common chimps. And in fact, if zoos have any problem, it's often because their communities are so small and bonobos don't have enough variety. They like variety. Bonobos <laughs> like variety in sex and friendship in sharing food, um, they, they, you know, one of the theories about why bonobos are the way they are and why common chimps are the way they are is because bonobos kind of grew up in the Congo on the side of the river in the jungle and they are in the trees above, you know, the, the bad critters and they're the biggest critters in the jungle, uh, aside from humans now, of course, are shooting them, but mm -hmm. when there's no humans, they're the biggest. So they can be very relaxed about life. And common chimps are out there in uh, the savanna and uh, they have a harder time. They have leopards and uh, lions after them. And so they kind of have to be a little more aggressive. Um, they're not the biggest and they have to go in smaller groups. Bonobos love to be in big groups. It's good when the females have a lot of friends, a lot of female friends so that they can gang up on a male who gets out of line. Uh, they don't like to kick other bonobos out. They just like to discipline them or what um, Claudine Andre of Lola Ya Bonobo calls teaching, <laughs> uh, which doesn't involve killing, mm -hmm. but it does sometimes hurt. Uh, because if the bonobo male is so stupid or uneducated as to 
um, rape a female or attack her children, her girlfriends will gang up on him. And that's why they like um, large communities. They like they like to share food. They 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 like an orgy. <laughs> Who doesn't? Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, exactly. We just don't like to allow it. We don't like to allow ourselves. But really, who doesn't? Who who doesn't read about that Roman history and go, hmm? Well, that might have been good if they weren't just killing all the people at the end of the orgy. But if they just had an orgy, hey, cool. Yeah. Well, that's the nobos. Um, and I. Yeah, I, I was also wondering, have they done any, um, uh, that you know of, brain scans on bonobos versus people to see how how they they differ um, as far as um, when there is something negative that happens, you know, when they want to, as you said, uh, discipline the male um, and how the brain works when they decide how to discipline him, if that question makes sense. Oh, it makes total sense, and I don't think I'm the one to answer it. Uh, although I do think they have like a, the similar parts to what we have. They have the intelligence of what we call, in human terms, a seven-year-old. I, I mean, I think that's just, and keep in mind, that's human terms. In some ways, they're more intelligent than us. But yeah, they can get to the level of a seven-year-old in terms of um, our capacity for learning. Uh, that kind of thing. Um, and common chimps tend to be better with tools. Bonobos are better with communication. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and their language could be very, very complex. We don't really know. They speak our language better than we speak theirs. Mm -hmm. We don't really okay. understand they, bonobo. Who, they, who, 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 they understand English, though, or whatever language. And they will communicate with sign language. And they will communicate with computers to point to things so that so the question was about bonobo brains and i'm not equipped to answer exactly what the differences are there are differences uh they're they're over 98 percent genetically similar to us um although i do understand and i'm not a geneticist either that uh the way that their genes are expressed is different in such a way that it causes a lot of difference so that even though they are extremely similar, it's the expression of genes, which don't ask me what that means, except that it means a lot of what being human is about. And that and common ancestry. of our genes is different than theirs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have a primatologist okay. or a neurologist maybe, or a geneticist on here to get into that yeah, stuff. And, and I certainly don't want to speak out of turn because I am none of those things. Uh, like you, I understand their brain structures to be very similar, uh, but but certainly <laughs> different. Uh, I am aware of some uh, cortisol level testing and some various research along that line. Uh, and from what I understand, they seem to have a greater ability to downregulate stress hormones uh, and to basically experience anxiety or uh, maybe a, that adrenaline rush feeling, those sorts of experiences potentially at a, a higher level. That's anthropomorphizing a, a little bit and it gets very tricky, but uh, seemingly they do have those stress reactions, but have any greater ability to sort of manage or downregulate that stress reaction, uh, at least per my understanding. I, um, I'll certainly uh, take a look and see what kind of research I can find on that and make sure to post that in the uh, footnote to the episode. Oh, I want that ability. Bonobos downregulating their stress compared to common chimps. Mm. And it was specifically a study of males. And it did show that bonobo males are a lot better at doing that than common chimps. Now, it didn't, I don't know, this particular study didn't compare it to humans, but it did show why common chimps, even when they're young, they're basically grumpy old apes. <laughs> and why bonobo males seem to be sipping on a fountain of youth. Mm -hmm. It's partly yeah, because cool. of the way the females treat them and the way that they treat each other. But it's also they got this ability to to be like yogis. They're very chill. And maybe that is something yogic. May, I mean, they, show, they say that, you know, people that are really into yoga and meditation can downgrade their stress much better than the rest of us. And so maybe that's 
not all just, you know, um, I guess, uh, nature, but somewhat nurture. Sure. Mm-hmm. Okay, that was all I had. Okay, well, beautiful. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your questions. I really appreciate you giving us a call. Yeah, thank you for calling in. Yeah, thank you. Have a great night. You got so, some real science-oriented people here. That's good. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, well, we are definitely known for and proud of our skeptics and uh, yeah. our strong stance on science as a uh, as an ideal. So, um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. It's absolutely fascinating to think about the uh, just the significance of this animal that I, I feel many people still haven't heard of, uh, and so to spend some time walking through that with you, even some scientists. And hey, march for science, but you scientists, march for the bonobos. <laughs> save them so you all can study them in all the different ways. Uh, and and I, I just think, um, you know, I, I try to spread the word in my own way. Uh, I think bonobos are sexy. I mean, maybe not like in a way you want to have sex with them, and I don't think you should. Although it has been shown that uh, when people look at bonobos having sex, makes them want to have sex, not with bonobos, but it makes them want to have sex, yeah. you know? And, uh, and, and so watch bonobos. I mean, that's the first step of my 12 step program. I have a 12 step program, but it's kind of the anti program. And the first step is to see the bonobos mm -hmm. and to be inspired by them. Cause all this talk is, is great and educational, but seeing them will certainly enlighten you. If you haven't done so already, uh, it'd be great. If you could go on one of those rare trips to um, the Congo, uh, even to Loli Abonobo, uh, or if you can't, to the zoo or a primate center where you can see bonobos and uh, and have them show you. And if you can't do any of that, well, you know, we got YouTube. Yay. <laughs> videos. Yeah, so your, your first step in unleashing your inner bonobo is to just join the bonobos, to see the bonobos. Uh, we definitely want to encourage everybody to investigate their own bonobo liberation therapy and uh, check out your book, The Bonobo Way, uh, yeah. as well as uh, your website, drsusanblock.com and your institute. Uh, Twitter, you're at Dr. Susie, and we'll be sure to include in the footnotes to this episode all of the, the great books that we've talked about, as well as some of the research, and uh, especially the links to the, uh, the Block Foundation and some of these other charities so that people can have an opportunity to really participate in protecting and saving this incredibly important resource. Yeah, well, yeah, call me anytime also if you're interested in bonobo liberation therapy or any kind of uh, sex therapy, which we mostly do over the phone. And yeah, I have a phone number where real people, uh, real human apes answer the phone. 626-461-5950, uh, you can call it. And we also have a community inspired by the Bonobos called Bonoboville. And, uh, you know, it's on the internet, bonoboville.com, as well as on terra firma it's actually in a place in la that you <laughs> can visit in reality and we have a lot of religious formerly religious people i have one guy here who's a i i give him an award for funniest um fundamentalist refugee and uh his, his uh, shout out to loser twersky uh one of our great bonobos who's a a refugee of fundamentalist judaism mm. you know we have refugees from all different uh, um, religions and and thought systems and uh, we're not a cult and uh, you know you can leave uh, we in fact like you to leave we're not like bonobos in that way if you don't get along <laughs> you should leave but uh, but we're very open to people and uh, we love to hear from people so join us for the show every Saturday night uh, it's live and then of course it's archived but you can also Watch it at drsusanblock.com for free. Amazing. Beautiful. Well, thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you to everybody who watched. And uh, yeah, Dr. Block, in the tradition started by Dr. Daryl Ray, we of course like to end every episode the same way. And uh, that's by encouraging our viewers to, I guess, free their inner bonobo and to go out and give themselves a, a big ol' orgasm. Or better yeah. yet, if somebody else won. 
जाती है 